All right, everybody. Welcome to today's lecture. Last time in class, we were talking about the idea of center of mass, which refers to where on an object the mass is located at, the average location. And today what we're going to do is we're going to start to talk about another topic known as the moment of inertia. And together, by understanding both of these concepts here, we'll be able to figure out more thoroughly how structures behave when subjected to applied loads and how those structures might fail. The next topic that we're going to discuss is buckling. So let's first start off by reviewing Newton's second law, everybody's favorite law because it's the easiest to remember because it's simply three letters, which is F equals MA. What this law means is that if you have a net force acting on an object, you will cause that object to accelerate. So we can see we've got our little mass up here at the top. If we are to apply a force to that object right there, that box will slide over and accelerate. Now, what would happen if instead of that little tiny box, we were to increase the mass and get something that was quite a bit larger or quite a bit heavier? You could just automatically intuit that rather than applying that little baby force to get that box to move, you're going to have to apply much greater effort to get that box to accelerate. And if you didn't apply a much bigger force, what would ultimately happen is that box would have a much lower acceleration or, as you have probably experienced at some point in your life, it won't even move at all. So, ultimately what this showcases is that mass is the property of an object that wants to resist motion. And if you remember back to Newton's first law, the law of inertia, Ultimately, what this means is that the greater the mass of an object, the greater its inertia, or the harder it is to move. Now, this is, a, in a physics sense, what inertia is all about. But we've all experienced inertia in our everyday lives. When would that be? Well, pretty much every morning that you wake up, especially this time of year, when you're nice and cozy under the covers, and it's dark and cold outside, I can guarantee you that the last thing you want to do when your alarm clock goes off is to wake up and leave the comfort of your bed. You just want to remain inert, possibly forever, or at least until you start watching Netflix. But ultimately, through this process, you are representing the law of inertia, which is that you don't want to move. And every object that has mass also showcases that same principle. So that's what's true in the sense of linear motion. But what happens when we look at Rotational motion. Well, our equation that we get for rotational motion is pretty much exactly the same as what we see for linear motion. As we discussed earlier in the class, in linear motion, when you take a force and you apply that force to an object through the object's center of mass, or in this case, the center of mass of this chair, that chair more or less moves in a straight line, but doesn't really go spinning around. If I instead apply that force, which we'll, we've talked about is a rotational force known as a moment, if we apply that force a distance away from the center of mass, what you'll see is that the chair actually begins to rotate about some point. So we'll let that chair go back over there. Maybe I'll bring it back over here. Bring it back to its home. So we look at these equations. They're very, very similar. Up here, we've got the sum of the forces. Down here, we've got the sum of the moments, or the rotational forces acting on an object. At the top, we've got mass times acceleration. And down below, we've got different symbols, but that more or less mean the same thing. Instead of mass times acceleration, we've got moment of inertia times angular acceleration, or rotational acceleration. So what do these terms mean? Well, we discussed before how the greater the mass of an object, the harder it is to move that object, or the greater inertia that it has. Well, that's going to be true here that the moment of inertia is the rotational equivalent of mass. And the greater the moment of inertia of a shape, the harder it is going to be to rotate that shape. That's exactly where the term moment of inertia comes from. We've got moments, or our rotational forces, and inertia. Relating those two things together will help us find the moment of inertia of a shape, which is related to its ability or willingness to rotate about a given point. So what does it have to do with? What does it relate to? Pretty much, you can sum up that the moment of inertia of any shape is going to be equal to the sum of every piece of mass of that shape or object times the distance from that little tiny piece of mass to the point of rotation. Now, it might seem pretty obvious to tell you that 
as you increase the mass of any object, it's going to be much harder to rotate that object. Or as we increase mass, we're increasing the moment of inertia or the resistance of that object to rotate. So this seems pretty evident because it's a lot easier for me to rotate that chair right there than it is for me to rotate, say, a giant whale. Or to rotate that chair with all the students in this classroom, which actually is none, but you could imagine. What's also going to be important is the distance, which is how far each tiny little piece of mass is away from the point of rotation. And you can actually see that that has the biggest factor of all because that term is squared. So what that means is that the farther away an object's mass is from a chosen point of rotation, the harder it's going to be to rotate that object. Now, you can see that these values for moment of inertia depend on mass and distance and are oftentimes given for many common shapes. Up here you can see our good old friends, the solid disk, the hollow disk, solid sphere, hollow sphere, a rod about its center, a rod about its end, and of course, because everyone's very interested in, is our teapot. Now, our teapot doesn't have a given value, but you can see the formula here necessary to derive the moment of inertia of that shape, as well as any shape. And ultimately, if we're using mass moment of inertia, the units for that are going to be kilograms times meters squared or mass times distance squared. So we all love a good challenge or a good race. Let's look right here. We've got five of our favorite shapes and their moments of inertia shown up here. The only shape that we don't have a moment of inertia for is this box. But what we're going to do is we're going to release these down the ramp and we're going to see what happens. So ask yourself, if all of these shapes have the same mass and we make the assumption that the ramp right here does have friction such that all of these shapes over here can rotate or roll, whereas our box is frictionless such that it can slide, which of these shapes will reach the bottom of the ramp first? Well, like any good race, we have to count them off. All right, on your mark, get set, and go. And they're off, and we can see that the shape that actually reaches the bottom first is maybe a bit of a surprise, but it's the box. Now, the reason this is the case is because the box, and all these shapes more generally, are having the moment of inertia, sorry, is because the box, and all the shapes more or less, are having their gravitational potential energy, MGH, converted into kinetic energy as they reach the bottom of the ramp. Now, the only shape here that doesn't rotate is the box, and that gives it an advantage. Now, because its MGH is converted to 1 half mv squared alone, rather than having any rotation, it will speed down the ramp and reach the bottom first. Whereas all the other shapes, because instead of just moving down the ramp, they also have to get rotating, it takes them a little bit more time to get going, and therefore it makes them move down the ramp a little bit slower than our box. A very easy demonstration for that is, it's much easier for me to walk from one point to another than it is for me to walk and spin at exactly the same time, which is not only dizzying, but also quite a challenge. So, as I stabilize myself, essentially what we can see here is that the blue uh, cube comes in first place, followed by the red solid sphere and the golden solid disk. Now, the reason that this is the case, as we said before, is more or less because of moment of inertia. The moment of inertia of the solid sphere is less than that of the solid disk, which means that it's easier to rotate that solid sphere than it is the solid disk. As a result, that shape will be easier to rotate and can actually move down the ramp faster. And you'll see that the same is true for both our fourth and fifth place shapes. So the eye of a hollow sphere has two-thirds mr squared, which is more than our third place sphere but less than our fifth place sphere or shape. So, so, what impact does this have on our figure skaters? Now, we've probably all seen the Olympics before. Maybe some of us have even figure skated ourselves. Have any of you ever really seen a figure skater that looks like this? Chances are you probably haven't. Somebody like this, or a sumo wrestler, is much better suited to sumoing and pushing people outside of a circle than they are figure skating. Figure skaters tend to look more like this. Now, why is that the case? That's the case because, well, our figure skater over here, Mr. Sumo Wrestler, is at kind of a disadvantage. Not only are they heavier, 
but their mass is distributed farther away from the point that they might want to rotate about, which would be through the central axis. And as a result, it's going to be much harder for that person to rotate. So as you can see here, a figure skater, when they go up to do their triple axel or quad toe or anything, they don't spread their arms wide. They actually put their arms very close to their body such that they can spin a lot faster. I'm now going to demonstrate this concept that we just talked about with our good friends, the figure skaters. I'm going to show you that if I put a lot of mass really far away from my body, and I kind of let myself spin about in this chair. I'm not moving particularly fast, but if I decide to pull my arms in towards the center, you can see that I spin up quite a bit faster and my chair starts to move around. I'll show that one more time. As I have the mass really far away from my body, you can see that I spin relatively slowly, but as I pull that mass in towards the center, I start to spin a lot faster. And because I'm a bit dizzy, let's move on. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a little demo that can showcase that rotating about the center of an object is always going to be easier than rotating about any other spot on that object itself. What we have is our good old handy dandy little stick here that I've cut. And you can see that I've drilled a couple holes in there. The reason this hole is there is because that's a mistake. I thought that was through the center of mass, but as you can see, it was just a little bit off. But this point right here is the roughly center of the stick, more or less, where I can balance it in my hand without it falling over. And what we're going to do is we're going to make the stick rotate by about a couple different points. Now, if I take my handy dandy mechanical pencil right here, which actually fits perfectly through the holes that I've drilled, what we can see is that if I apply a force that doesn't go through the point of rotation, but actually is applied away from that point of rotation and perpendicular, that stick that we've got here is going to rotate. And in this case, you can see it moves back and forth just like a pendulum would. Now, what would happen if I put the pencil through the center of mass instead, and I apply roughly the same exact force that we just did a second ago? Now, the whole point of this demo here was to show you that it's easier to spin about the center of mass than it is about any other shape. So, let's see what happens. I'm going to take my hand here and apply roughly the same exact force that we did just a second ago, and we're off. Our stick doesn't wobble back and forth like a pendulum and complete no rotations. Rather, it spins many, many times and completes multiple revolutions about the center of mass. What this shows you is that the moment of inertia of a shape is always the lowest about the central point. And the lower the moment of inertia, the easier it is for that shape to spin. As we apply the force down at the bottom here, and try to get this thing to rotate about the top. It has a higher moment of inertia because it's spinning away from the center, and therefore it's harder to rotate. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick calculation or derivation of how you compute the moment of inertia of any shape, like our stick here, about any point. So let's put our stick down, and grab our markers, and get to work. So we're given in our textbook that for a rectangular shape, or even a rod, the moment of inertia about the central point I center is going to be equal to 1 12th m l squared. So we can see here that our rod is given with a length of l. And if we were choose to choose to rotate our rod or our rectangular uh, block here about the central point, we would encounter a moment of inertia of 1 12th m l squared. Well, what does the parallel axis theorem say if we wanted to rotate our object instead about a point at the end of the rod? Now, if we were to be rotating at this point right here, instead of through the center, which we've defined as the minimum that a moment of inertia can be for any shape, we know that the i about any point at all is going to be equal to the i of that shape about its center plus m d squared. I like to call this term over here the adjustment factor. And basically what this just means is as I go away from the center of the shape, it's going to get harder. So I have to add in kind of an adjustment factor here to account for the added difficulty of rotating that shape about a point that's not its center of mass. So if we did this for this shape right here, and instead of rotating about the middle, we're rotating about the end, we'd have to say that the i of this rod about the end would be equal to the i about the center, which is 1 12th 
ml squared, which we were given, plus the mass of that rod, which is unchanged, times the distance squared. Well, what is the distance squared? That distance squared is the distance between the point that you're trying to compute the moment of inertia about relative to the center of mass. For this particular example, you can see that that distance right here is L over 2. So if we were to plug that in right here as our distance, L over 2, and we were to square that term, what we'd get out of this equation here would be that the I about the N would be 1 12th ML squared plus M times L squared over 4. Now, as you can see, we would multiply this by 3 right here. And this term right here would become m times 3 over 12 L squared. Now, if we wanted to add that to that, what we would ultimately get out of this whole equation right here would be that the i about the n is 3 12 ML squared plus 1 12 ML squared, which would be 4 12 ML squared. So we can see 4 12 ML squared can simplify to 1 third ML squared. And ultimately, what we can see is that the moment of inertia of our shape about the end is 1 third ml squared, whereas the moment of inertia about the center is 1 12th ml squared. And as you can see, the moment of inertia about the center of the shape is less than the moment of inertia about the end. So in that example, we just talked about how to use parallel axis theorem to solve for the moment of inertia of any shape about any point. And what we used was mass moment of inertia. However, in this class, it's important to remember that what we'll be doing is using area moment of inertia. But the parallel axis theorem remains the same, even when we're using area moment of inertia. Essentially, our equation just becomes the following, that the moment of inertia of a shape about any point or axis is equal to the moment of inertia about its center plus AD squared. So really all that's changed is instead of md squared, we now have ad squared. So that distance d is usually referring to the distance between the x bar of the whole system minus xi of a particular shape, which I'll explain this more in the handwritten uh, solution in a minute. But for right now, what we can see is that the bottom of our shape would be referred to as y equals 0, and the midpoint would be y equals h over 2. So the distance that we'll put in here is essentially the point of the midpoint, h over 2, minus 0. So to calculate the moment of inertia of this shape about its end, we would say 1 12th base height cubed plus the area, which is base times height, which you can see we have right here, times the adjustment factor d squared, the distance, which we said is h over 2 squared. So as a result, the next step, what you would see, is that this could simplify to, we have the moment of inertia about the end is equal to 1 12th base height cubed plus 1 4th base height cubed, which, if you simplify one more time with fractions, you get that the moment of inertia of a rectangle about its end is equal to 1 3rd base times height cubed, which, guess what? If you go to the moment of inertia and center of mass table that we provide you for the exam, you will see that this answer that we have just arrived at is the moment of inertia of a rectangle about the x-axis. We just derived that by using the fact that we understood the moment of inertia about the x-centroidal axis. So on the exam, we will make sure to provide you with the following table, which gives you all of the moments of inertia and center of mass for typical shapes. The last thing that we really need to discuss, which we'll explain in the example in a minute, is how to compute the moment of inertia of a system. And the moment of inertia of a system, in this case about the y centroidal axis, which I've identified right here, is going to be equal to whoop, the i of shape 1 plus the i of shape 2 minus the i of shape 3, because here we have a negative area. So you'll see how this plays out in our example which we can look at on the following page, and I will work out by hand. So here's an old exam problem, and essentially what we'll do is we'll solve this to not only one, solve for the centroid, which is our step right here at the very top, but we'll also solve for the moment of inertia about the horizontal axis through the centroid, 
which essentially will be ICX. So let's label ICX a little bit more clearly. ICX will look something like this. And that's what we have right here. And ICY will look something like this. That goes through the center of our shape. And I apologize for my squiggly lines. But that's what we'll do in our handwritten example, which we'll go to right now. All right, everyone. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at a moment of inertia question that would be very typical of an exam, which is why this is labeled problem number four. Now, for this problem here, the first part of the question asks you to find the location of the centroid, both the x bar and the y bar. Usually on an exam, what the question would ask you to do is solve for one or the other, and then solve for the moment of inertia, either about the centroidal uh, x-axis or the centroidal y-axis. And I'll kind of explain what those two things are in a second. But the first thing we'll do is we'll solve question A, which is what we've done thus far in class. And when you look at question A, it pretty much asks us to solve for x bar and y bar. Well, solving for x bar is actually quite easy in this problem because what x bar is referring to is the distance from our x and y 0, 0 point, or our datum, which I've chosen down here, to the center of both shapes. Now, both of our shapes are rectangles, and I've identified those here. Shape 1 will consider as the top rectangle, and shape 2 will consider as the bottom rectangle. What we can see is that both of these shapes also have the same area. As a result, our shape is symmetrical. And we can see very clearly that the middle of this shape here would be 3, and the middle of this shape would also be 3, because we can tell that this distance right here is 2 inches, and that this distance here is also 2 inches. As a result, we can, by inspection, determine the x-bar and determine that x-bar is equal to 3 inches. Now, this would be very unlikely to actually be in an exam for us to ask you to x-bar because it is so simple. So let's look at the y-bar. To solve for the y-bar, we set up our table the way that we always do. We have our shape, the area, and now we have yi. The next column, what we'll do after we identify the yi, is ai, yi. All right, so what is the yi of the first shape? Well, our first shape is this one right here. So to get to the center of this shape, which we know is probably about right here, we know that it is three inches off of the ground right here. And that is two inches off of the ground right there. So this is two inches plus three inches is equal to five inches. When we look at the center of this shape right here, the center of this shape right there is going to be half of the way from the bottom is going to be one inch. So when we solve for AIYI, 12 times 5 is going to get us 60. And 12 times 1 is going to get us 12. And this is going to be inches cubed, which is kind of a, a silly unit. So I'll get rid of that because that looks a little weird. So I'll say inches cubed. So now we know that Y bar is equal to the sum of ai xi, or sorry, ai yi divided by the sum of ai. So in this particular example right here, the sum of this category is 72, and the sum of this category is da -da -da -da, 24. As a result, we have 72 over 24 is equal to 3 inches as our y bar for our whole shape. And we box our answer. Let's check to see if this logic makes some sense. So basically they're telling us that the centroid of this entire shape is right here. Through this line here at x equals 3 and a total of about 3 inches from the bottom. That seems to be pretty reasonable to me that if I put my finger right there, I would balance that shape. Our next step in this problem, now that we have solved for A, is to solve for the moment of inertia about the centroidal x-axis and the moment of inertia about the centroidal y-axis. Now, let's think about what that actually means. So the centroidal x-axis is the x-axis that passes through the centroid. 
So this is our x prime centroidal. And our centroidal y-axis is this axis right here. It's yc prime. That's what we're going to do to solve. So let's look at what we've got going on here. All right, I've now got us a new sheet of paper. And pretty much I've written down our solution from the last step, which is x bar equals 3 inches and y bar equals 3 inches. And this is our centroid right here. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at solving for the moments of inertia about this axis right here, which we call the x centroidal axis because it is along the x axis more or less in a horizontal fashion. And we have the centroidal y axis, which goes this way right here. Now, some things we know. As you can see here from this, if we rotate about the x centroidal axis, our moment of inertia is 1 12th base height cubed. And the reason that height is cubed is because the height is the distance that's perpendicular to the centroidal x-axis. And if we look at IYC, we can see that the equation is the same, but the H and the B are flipped. So we have 1 12th height times base cubed. And the reason that base is cubed is because that is the per distance that's perpendicular to the axes in question. So the parallel axis theorem says that the I of any shape is equal to the moment of inertia about its center plus ad squared, which we call this adjustment factor. And you'll see how this comes into play. So the question asks us to solve for the moment of inertia of the whole shape about the centroidal x-axis and the moment of inertia of the whole shape about the centroidal y-axis. Well, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to say that it's essentially just the sum of the moments of inertia of each shape about the axis in question. So ixc is equal to i1xc plus i2xc. And each of these things right here is going to be equal to the i of the shape, which we'll say is i center plus ad squared. Now let's go back to the whole page and calculate that. Okay. Okay, so now what we're going to do is I've created a table just like we did before, but now I'm going to use it for moments of inertia. So I've got our two shapes here again, and now what we're going to do is we're going to solve for the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis for each shape, and then add in the adjustment factor. So for our first shape, we're doing the moment of inertia about the centroidal x-axis, which we know is 1 12th base height cubed. So when we plug that in here, 1 12th base height cubed, what we're going to have for shape number one, which is this shape right here, is that its base is 2 and its height is 6. So we have 1 12th 2 times 6 cubed. And this gets us a value of 36. If we do the same for the bottom shape, we have 1 12th base height cubed again, which in this case is 1 12th times 6 times 2 cubed. Well, 2 cubed is 8, 8 times 6 is 48, divided by 12 is 4. Now what we have to do is take this fancy adjustment factor into play. How do we do that? Well, the first thing for both of this is the area. And we know that the area of each is 6 by 2. So that's pretty straightforward. Essentially, our centroidal x-axis is this axis right here. So to solve for the distance away, we're essentially computing this distance right here which is the distance from the centroidal x-axis of this particular shape and of this particular shape. So this would be d1 and this would be d2. And again, 2 is right here and 1 is labeled at the top, just so we have clarity on the image as well. So if we have d1 and d2, sorry, I keep grabbing all these pens, but now what we can see we have is that A here is 12, and the distance from shape 1 to shape 2, well, we know that the center of this one right here is 3 from the bottom. The centroid of this one we actually had was 5 inches. And we know that the height of this is 3 inches. So the difference here is 2. We have 2 squared. Now what's actually fairly useful is if we go back to our old sheet, we can see that before we had five. So essentially the distance di, and I can write this over here, the distance is usually equal to the y bar minus the yi, or it is equal to the x bar minus 
the yi. And I guess you could probably say that this is like the absolute value of these things here. That's how far are we from that particular spot. So given that the center of this shape here was at y equals five inches and the height of this is at three, the distance between these two things is two. And therefore for our adjustment factor here, we get a value of 48. And down here, the height of this spot right here, this y was one inch. And if we go back to our sheet from before, again, you can see that our one was the yi of this shape. So if our di is equal to the y bar, which is three minus one, our di here is also equal to two. Therefore, you can see that we're gonna have the same exact adjustment factor, which is 12 times two squared. And again, we get 48. Now, when you add this up, just make a brief total column. You can see here we've got 36 plus 48. That gets us a value of 40, or sorry, 84 right here. And when you add up these two things right here, that gets us a value of 52. This means that the IXC is going to be equal to 84 plus 52, which in our particular case, is going to be equal to dun, 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 136. Therefore, our final answer for IXC is equal to 136 inches to the fourth. And now we have to set up our table for the IYC. All right, now our final step is to solve for the IYC. So I've finished setting up our table here. And what I've done is I've gone ahead and put in the equation for I about the centroidal y-axis for our rectangle, which we're given. Remember, the centroidal y-axis is this one right here. So our equation for that is 1 12th height times base cubed. Again, remember that when we're swim, uh, swinging around the y-axis, it's going to be the base that matters the most because this, we're swinging essentially this way. So we have 1 12th height times base cubed. For our first shape, that's going to be 1 12th. Our height is 6, and our base is 2 cubed. So when we plug that in, well, we get a whopping value of 4. Down over here for our second shape, our height, as you can see, is 2, and our base is 6. So we're going to have 1 twelfth 2 times 6 cubed is going to be equal to a value of 36. Now, this is the interesting part, the AI DI squared. Well, if you look, all of our centroids are aligned already along the Y axis. Therefore, our adjustment factor would be the area times a distance of zero because our distance in this case isn't this vertical distance. It's how far do we need to go in the X direction to get to the coordinate of the Y centroidal axis. That, in this particular case, is zero. I don't have to go to the right or to the left to be on this centroidal line. I'm already there. So, AI DI squared for both of these is zero. And that makes us really happy because we have much less work to do. Therefore, our total is 4 and 36. And as a result, our IYC is 4 plus 36. If you can do some math, you would calculate that IYC is equal to 40 inches to the fourth. And there you go. That is it. We have now solved this problem. And really, it all just comes down to essentially these three things. It comes down to understanding that the moment of inertia of a shape is just equal to, of a, of a composite shape, is equal to the sum of all of the parts. And each part, you must use the parallel axis theorem to solve for. And pretty much by using your givens in the table, you put it all together, you can organize it and use this little trick right here. And I'll circle that in purple so it's even more clear for you that di in your adjustment factor equation is usually equal to the following. Well, there you go. That's it.